Uh, so today's webinar is going to be uh, regarding improving prep from uh, prep HPLC chromatography and some choices and techniques to, that you can make to improve your prep HPLC separation. Uh, there's my email address. Feel free to reach out to me via email if you have any questions regarding this webinar or any other application uh, associated questions. So today, uh, an outline of what we'll be discussing today is we'll be discussing the principles and components involved in PrEP HPLC separation, different ways to optimize PrEP HPLC methods to increase your throughput, uh, guidelines for sample loop loading and eliminating sample loss, basic column care and protection, and then solvent loading choice and its effect on loading capacity and chromatographic integrity. So we're going to begin with some PrEP HPLC basics, and these are principles for PrEP HPLC separations. And so ultimately, is the, what's the, the ultimate question is what drives chromatographic separations? And um, for liquid chromatography, this consists of two phases. Uh, one, our mobile phase, which is a liquid, and then a stationary phase, and this is, consists of whatever our column packing or stationary phase is. And so we're limited by the solubility of our sample. Um, in some type of loading solvent. And what is driving the chromatographic separation is the interaction between um, interaction between your molecule of interest, in this case, in this picture, is the blue molecule, with the solvent molecules, in this case, isopropanol or water mixture, and then the functionalized silica groups here uh, on the stationary phase. So how well that molecule interacts with the, the mobile phase and the stationary phase is going to dictate how fast it travels down the column. This is a reverse phase representation, uh, which would be similar to what you would encounter in prep HPLC. Uh, for normal phase, <clears throat> your, your mobile phase would be a, a, um, a weak to strong organic solvent, and you'd be interacting with the bare silica um, without functionalization in most cases. So why choose prep HPLC? Our ultimate goal is to purify a mixture of compounds. So we want to get our target compound as pure as possible. Uh, and to quantify the separation of different compounds, we use the resolution. We define that as resolution. Um, the equation for resolution uh, is here, and it consists of three components. Uh, the first component, the N value, refers to the efficiency. The second component, the alpha component, is the selectivity. And the portion consisting of the K uh, represents the retention. And so each of these is going to have a different magnitude impact on the resolution equation based upon um, the formula listed here. So to kind of visualize that, uh, we're going to first look at how uh, retention can affect um, the resolution equation. So retention, which is our K value, is a capacity factor, retention factor. And this is ultimately the retention time of a compound on the column. And this factors in the dead volume. So your solvent front basically travels time zero down the column. And the amount of time that it takes for your compound, the retention time, is TR. So K is TR minus um, the solvent front divided by the solvent front. A higher K value indicates that the sample interacts strongly with the stationary phase. So really, K values above 20 um, um, the compound's really just setting, sitting at the head of the column. It's not really eluding at all. It's just sitting at the top of the column, not moving down. And as we get to K values between 1 and 10, now that compound starts to loop down the column, and we can take advantage of the, the separation and the interaction between the um, stationary phase and the mobile phase of the compound. As we get a retention value that's smaller than 1, then that means that the compound is basically traveling at the solvent front. So we're not getting really any retention, compound is not retained at all, and it's traveling with the solvent front at the highest um, linear velocity. The retention is greatly affected by changing the solvent system strength, so gradient elution as we go from 0 to 100%, we increase the strength of percent B. This inherently takes uh, advantage of uh, uh, modifying the retention to a lower K value, where it's staying on top of the column to increase the strength that starts to travel. The next uh, section here is that we're going to look how the selectivity 
factor affects resolution. And so like selectivity is really important because uh, it defines how two different molecules are going to interact with the, the media. So if two compounds interact similarly, they have the same uh, selectivity. So we're not going to be able to get very good resolution because they um, they are basically behaving similarly in regards to the stationary phase or the mobile phase. So they're going to travel similarly. Um, we want to be able to maximize the selectivity for one compound over and ever, over another in order to improve the separating power of the chromatography system. And so selectivity is probably going to have the most drastic impact on the resolution equation. So as we increase the selectivity from 1 to 1.25, we basically have a linear uh, magnitude. Um, if we improve the selectivity, we're, we're improving the resolution by a very similar factor. The retention time or retention about factor of the resolution equation has kind of a, a plateauing effect. So we can only really maximize the K value to a certain point. So we see very good um, impact in changing the retention from you know zero to five, but from five to ten, the gain's not so great on resolution. And as we get above ten, it really plateaus off. So we really want to work with a K range from zero to ten. Uh, for retention and increasing the retention more doesn't really do anything. It's just sitting at the top of the column. And then finally, the efficiency equation basically defines how well the column is working. It defines column performance. And you can see once again, it doesn't plateau off as much as the K value, but it really has diminishing returns over time because it's the square root of the efficiency uh, being factored into the resolution equation. So it's not um, uh, as great of a magnitude. Um, gain as with selectivity. So ways that we can adjust the selectivity. So we can affect selectivity in several different ways. Uh, one of the easiest ways uh, is just to change your solvent system. So in this example from an analytical column, uh, we have a, a five component mixture here. And we see clear elution for peaks one, two, and three, and then four and five kind of co together in 40% acetonitrile. If we change to 50% methanol, we can actually see that peaks two and three now co -elute, but four and five are now isolable, and we get baseline res resolution between them. So as we change from acetonitrile to methanol, we've changed the selectivity of the system so that uh, four and five are now interacting differently with the mobile phase versus two and three, which are now uh, um, interacting similarly uh, on the mobile phase to each other. So depending on which compound you're interested in purifying, uh, one method would be more suitable than the other. Another uh, component that can have a drastic impact on the selectivity is by adjusting the pH of the mobile phase. So as we uh, add modifiers, acidic or basic modifiers, so acidic mo modifiers that are common would be TFA, formic acid, and then um, basic modifiers like ammonium salts or triethylamine, we can see how in this example, as we change the pH by 0.1 unit um, from 5.2 to 5.1, that we're able to get separation between peaks 5 and 6. Uh, but at 5.2, more towards neutral, we're not able to get that separation. And then finally, more um, kind of a more drastic change, um, and there's a lot more uh, options for different columns, uh, is to change the stationary phase. So in this case, we get separation of peaks one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven uh, using a uh, cyano column. However, if we change to a functionalized phenyl column, uh, peaks four and five are no longer, um, they're co eluding so we don't have baseline resolution between them. So in this case, the cyano column offers us better selectivity for isolating out all, all seven peaks. And the mobile phase also changed too, so 35% acetonitrile to the 48%. The last component of the resolution equation is efficiency. So uh, with PrEP HPLC, um, you know, we already have greater plate number performance than our flash columns because we're working with smaller particle sizes. Um, the efficiency effectively describes the broadening of the band, and this, you know, ultimately relates to column performance. So 
The one nice thing about efficiency though with columns that you're reusing is it's a good indicator of column integrity. So once you start to see your efficiency uh, begin to decrease over time, uh, then there usually needs to be some sort of change, you know, change to your column, change your guard column, your column performance is the, the physical characteristics of your column are starting to change and it's starting to affect your chromatography. Um, but if your efficiency is staying relatively, um, your plate count is, is staying relatively the same for that column over time, you know that you're working with a, a column that's uh, working well. Um, another way we can affect efficiency is in our column choice. So we could choose a longer column to increase the separating power. Uh, obviously this increases the method time. The, the trade-off of this is that as we went, go back and if we were to go back and look at the resolution uh, equation graph and the effect of um, efficiency, selectivity, and, and um, retention on it, uh, efficiency, as you increase your efficiency, efficiency by an order of one, your ma the magnitude of it isn't as great because it's basically the square of the, the efficiency. Um, another thing to note, if you're working with larger molecules, proteins, things like that, um, longer columns aren't necessarily going to provide greater efficiency for larger molecules. So keep that in mind. This, for small molecules, though, um, longer columns are going to provide better separating power. The other things that kind of go into efficiency is not only your column, but also your injection volume, which we're going to discuss in detail later because that's something that we can control. Um, basically that initial band broadening at the, the top of the column as we load our sample, uh, dead volume in the system, and then uh, the flow rate. So we're working in the optimal flow rate for our columns. So there's an optimal flow rate of, you know, for example, uh, 20 millimeter column, the optimal flow rate is about 18.9 for a 10 micron size column, or five micron size column. As we start to increase, um, we can increase the, the flow rate, um, but we start to deviate a little bit from optimal um, efficiency numbers, although the particle size is, is kind of forgiving for that. So we can go ahead and increase that as long as we don't have limitations with back pressure. So in general, a prep HPLC system is a very similar path as a flash system or an analytical HPLC system. We have our solvent reservoirs uh, where we have our A and B solvents. Um, we have our gradient former and pumps, and so we're mixing our, our solvents and, and delivering a certain percent um, solvent strength. And then we have a sample introduction valve, which we're going to discuss sample introduction in great detail here, but that's something where um, a component area of the system where we can um, make improvements to our separations. And then we have our separation column, which we've already discussed some column characteristics and how that affects our resolution and, and our separations. And then uh, as your compounds loop down the column and get separation, then we need to be able to detect them so that we can trigger uh, fraction collection or if you're using analytical uh, HPLC, then you can do integration or quantitation. Um, and so we're going to discuss a little bit um, regarding some factors in optimizing your method for detection too. So in general, there's kind of two two types of um, solvent delivery methods you can do. You can do an isocratic method, um, and this is a constant solvent composition, so I'm running it at 30% um, methanol water the entire time, and the compounds are going to come out. Um, when they come out, there's usually going to be a large gap between the compounds. Um, this offers the highest resolution, though, because, there's a, because of that large gap between compounds, because essentially um, your retention is going to be really high for one compound and not for the other. As you get compounds that start to co-elute, we need to work towards an isocratic method to get separation to maximize that. One of the advantages of isocratic separations is it does permit stacked injections as you can um, um, purify the, uh, multiple injections of the same compound over and over because your solvent composition is not varying. More commonly though, um, in prep HPLC with purifications, especially small molecules, things like that, or you're purifying from uh, multiple impurities, um, is a gradient method. So there's two variants of this. You can do step gradients, and you'll see this in, in flash chromatography production scale, um, where basically you'll, you'll run it like 10% uh, of uh, B solvent, and then you'll 
do that for a period of time and then you'll jump up to 30, uh, up to 50% and just slowly jump up so you can isolate each compound. And so it's basically a series of isocratic steps. Um, what seems to be more effective is a linear gradient. So basically running a gradient from zero to, or from 10 to 100%, depending on your column, and then doing a, uh, um, so th this basically changes the retention of the solvents, uh, of your compounds as the solvent strength increases. Um, so this increasing solvent strength allows separation of compounds. It um, is going to minimize resolution between compounds, so they're going to come out kind of back to back, um, but it's going to be faster. So one way we can take advantage of this is to do focus gradients. So do a, a focus gradient over um, the solvent strength of the system where your compound's actually eluding down the column. And so this gives similar resolution as an isocratic method and then allows some error in setting up optimal solvent composition. So we'll discuss that a little further uh, for method development in the next section. So prep HPLC method development. And so what are the goals of optimizing our method or developing it? Um, to allow for faster runs. We want to be able to purify our compound quickly. Uh, we want to be able to purify as much compound as possible, as quick as possible, so we can maximize the loading of the, the sample onto the column. This also allows us to minimize solvent usage uh, by using a, uh, an optimal method because we can take um, take the we can minimize the time of the method to, to allow baseline resolution. So we just need a baseline resolution to get separation. We don't need the extra um, gap in between compounds eluding. Um, we don't gain anything by that because it's just uh, clean solvent, basically. And it also minimizes any workup um, for our fraction. So if you guys use volatile mo um, modifiers, you prefer to use volatile mod modifiers that you can evaporate quickly. Uh, one of the common ways in a lot of labs that people are using to develop PrEP HPLC methods is to take um, an analytical system and basically develop a system, a set of zones. So. Um, they do an analytical scouting gradient on their analytical system, and they know that uh, if a compound comes out in the specific zone, that they need to run a, a gradient pro profile um, of a certain percent B to a certain percent, percent B. So, for example, here we have a peak that comes out at 5.075. So this is uh, right in the middle of zone three. And so it would suggest that we run a, uh, a gradient from 25 to 45% B. And so basically anything outside of that zone is going to, um, resolution is going to devolve. Uh, so peaks uh, that come out later are probably going to co-elute as one peak late. And then peaks that come out earlier are going to co-elute as one peak also. But you're going to have a larger gap between um, the compound at five around five minutes there and the impurities next to it at 3.7 and 6.3 uh, minutes. So we maximize the resolution around that. What we can do then is that we can then increase the loading of the compound to maximize that dead, that dead space there because we've optimized our method to where that compound is eluding and separating down the column. Um, Usually this is set up in uh, in the lab, so they ran their analytical system and they they run some you run tests to kind of calibrate your prep system to your analytical system. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is that for this kind of uh, correlation to work, you need to be using the same column chemistry. Uh, that way you have the same selectivity in your prep and your analytical. One limitation of this um, is that as you deviate from the middle of the zone, so if you're at the edge of a zone, so say that peak around 3.7, um, if that was after four minutes, we would go ahead and be in zone three there, so we'd be eluding it faster. Um, you start to lose optimal resolution. So this is one of the limitations of this, is that as you get to the extremes of the zone, you're starting to lose, to lose some resolution ability and separating power. So here's an example uh, just to show you how focusing a gradient over a, a certain range can improve your resolution. So this is just a series of uh, different parabens. Um, 
as we look, as we run this uh, this this run from uh, I think t uh, 10 to 100 percent here, we can see the the initial DMSO peak, that big broad peak in the beginning, and then some impurities, and then we see the four uh, parabens coming through, and you barely get you get baseline resolution for most of them. Peaks three and four there kind of co-elute. But if we were to go ahead and focus this gradient over uh, a range from 67 to 77% uh, there, basically we can you can see the improved results on the bottom there. Now we're getting minutes of baseline separation between compounds. And so what that allows us to do is that now we can increase the loading of the compound to maximize our throughput. So on the AccuPrep, we have a really neat feature that uh, we've incorporated a focus gradient generator to help with method development um, on the AccuPrep. And so this is really useful when multiple injections are needed. Um, it provides a simple, easy user interface that uh, uh, calculates close to optimal conditions for you. Uh, the nice thing compared to the zone um, zone method here is that it's going to it's going to predict a um, value that's unique to each compound. So if you're on the edge of a zone, it's going to actually choose a range that's centered around that peak, not necessarily just putting you into a zone. Very easy to use. Uh, it eliminates the need to program a series of focus gradients uh, into your system as defaults and allows you to customize it for each uh, unique separation that you have. Um, it also basically allows you to use your HP 150 as, uh, as an analytical system as you can run a 4.6 millimeter column and then scale up to your larger run or you could even uh, self scout on the same column uh, and just doing a small injection. Um, the AccuPrep allows it has a feature on it that allows you to bypass the loop when you use a smaller column. Uh, use and this helps to reduce the delay volume on the 4.6 millimeter column. And so you can run your scouting method on any any size column and then scale up to a larger column as needed, or scale up to the same column with larger loading. So the focus gradient generator procedure is kind of a quick walkthrough to kind of illustrate how it how we, how it occurs. So essentially when you install a column on the AccuPrep, you need to create the scouting method. And uh, we do this in our configuration screen under the Prep HPLC tab. Um, you select your column, uh, hit define methods, and then choose new scouting method. So when that comes up, we can enter some variables unique to our scouting method. So depending on the column, we can uh, change the initial percent B. So with C18 columns, we normally work from 5 to 10 percent initial percent B. But maybe you're using a C18 AQ column, and so this expands your separation uh, where you can go ahead and work down at 0% B. Uh, so for really polar compounds that are eluding early, the C18 AQ is a good alternative um, column media for that to give you better attention. Um, you can go ahead and name your method. You can create multiple scout methods where you run different uh, gradients. Maybe you want to run it from 5%. Uh, 10%. You can create multiples. You can also create uh, uh, changes in your focus range though. There you can do plus or minus 5%, plus or minus 10%. Um, and then you can also adjust the flow rate. So if you like to run your columns faster, you can adjust that there and it's automatically going to factor that into your scouting method. So now we go back to the main screen on the AccuPrep. We would select our column and we would choose the scout method. Uh, so that's what we named it or whatever you named your scout method. And it's going to generate a method with a six minute gradient. If you're running a 150 millimeter long column, if you're running a longer column, it's going to be longer. And then it's going to have a washout phase, basically you just push everything through the system and off the column if you have any really strongly retained compounds. Um, essentially the scout method is not going to let you change anything because all of these gradient, the gradient profile is built into the algorithm and if we make changes then our algorithm is not correct. So you're basically locked out from making any changes to the gradient length. You can make detection changes uh, in the method editor, however. So we go ahead and run the scouting method. We've got uh, five components here in this mix. Um, all of them are pretty well resolved or we get baseline res resolution between all of them, but keep in mind this is a scouting run. 
low injection volume and low injection uh, concentration. So we're not loading a lot of compound onto the column. So we can go ahead and uh, when the run's done, this screen's going to show up. The focus button here is going to be evident um, or visible. Um, when you do a scouting gradient, if you're not doing a scouting gradient, that button will not be visible. So you have to set it up properly in the configuration screen like we discussed. And basically, you're going to be able to just select a peak of interest. So say we're interested in, peak, in purifying peak three. I'm going to go ahead and select peak three. I can zoom in on there if I need to and optimize the, the location. But that red cursor selects is essentially selecting where uh, we want to focus our gradient around. Then the next choice is to go ahead and choose um, which you know, so move the red line to the desired peak and then choose the column that we want to do our scale up on. So in this case, we're going to be scaling up to a 20 by 150 column. Um, and then you're going to hit the focus button. But you could also scale up to any other columns you have installed on the system. And keep in mind that your scout, scout and prep column must be the same media. Otherwise, your selectivities are different. We're going to see um, uh, variability because of that. So your scout method is going to be loaded. So in this case, we chose uh, peak number three. It's going to generate a, a gradient from uh, about 40, 43 to 53% there. And we're going to run that. And you can see the resolution gain here. So now peak three here is going to loot around six minutes. Um, the first two peaks are starting to co-elute. Uh, and that's fine. We weren't interested in, in uh, recovering those, so that's something that we can sacrifice there. We don't worry about that. And then you also notice peaks uh, four and five are starting to have kind of some odd peak shape, and and uh, but you do get baseline resolution there. But we get like three, two to two minutes on the front edge, and then three to four minutes on the back edge of resolution around peak three. So now what we can do is we can go and scale up the loading of it and load more compound and maximize that that empty space in the in the gradient with our uh, increased loading of the compound. So the target peak is always going to be kind of in the center of the grid around six. I would say five to five to eight minutes that peak is going to come out. It just kind of depends on the, the unique compounds you're working with. But it's going to come out in the center of that gradient. So we've discussed the choice uh, choices we have when we're doing method development for our prep separations. The next component that I really want to focus on is what's the um, the sample prep and uh, injection techniques and things like that for prep HPLC because there's a lot of choices that we can make that affect our chromatography and uh, we have uh, some gains that we can make by making uh, positive choices um, in regards to this. So kind of the first uh, question really when you're doing sample reduction is what's the best technique for loading my sample? And so unlike flash chromatography, um, all your prep HPLC lo loading of samples is, is via liquid. So we can do this several different ways. We can do manual injection through a lure port. Uh, we can use an auto sampler or an auto injector that's syringe driven. And then uh, recently on the HP 150 is we've added a feature with the sample load pump. And so this allows you to load large volumes of sample um, of dilute sample potentially if you have solubility problems with some compounds. Um, and it's really useful for uh, peptide protein purifications and um, some other scale up opportunities. So the key for liquid loading though is that the dissolution solvent is very important. And this is probably the most, one of the most critical choices you can make in affecting your chromatography. And so the loading technique uh, uh, is going to affect your loading. So if you're doing the auto sampler, you can do multiple, or auto injector, you can do multiple injections. Um, auto sampler the same way. Sample load pump, you're doing usually a large volume of, an, of a really dilute sample. And then manual injection, you're kind of limited to whatever your syringe size is. So um, these different techniques affect the amount of compound we can load because of our loading volume. Um, one of the most probably important things on sample prep is we need to filter or centrifuge our samples. And this protects the system uh, at the injection valve interface with the rotor seal. Um, if we get particulates in there, eventually they're going to end up scratching and creating leaks in your injection valve and you have to replace your, your rotor seal. 
Um, additionally, and probably more importantly, because of the cost, uh, is it to protect your column investment. Um, so as we get those, if you have particulates in your sample, eventually those collect onto the frit of the column over time, and they're going to start to hinder your column performance and um, and you know, create column uh, back pressure issues, things like that, and that's going to lead to column voids and, and ultimately you're replacing your column sooner than you'd like. Uh, some other things you can use to protect your column involvement investment would be guard columns and inline filters. Uh, the guard columns basically act as a sacrificial um, media there for collecting particulate and heavily, heavily retained, retained compounds. Uh, and you can easily replace the guard column for $400 versus spending $4,000 on a or more on a prep column. So once you start to see your efficiency starting to go, if you have a guard column and a column, replacing that guard column or taking out a line and then doing the run on your column, you'll see the efficiency is fine for the column, but your guard column is found bad. You can just replace that versus replacing your more expensive column. So one of the most important factors when we're loading our compound is how much can we load. Um, and so this is a good guideline for the kind of the ranges of the amount of compound you can load onto a column and see good separations. Um, keep in mind, you, I mean, you have a, a, a range basically from um, 0.1 to 1% essentially if you're loading on reverse phase. If you're loading on the bare silica, you have um, a 1% to 10% range um, for your, your loading capacity there because you have more uh, interaction with the silica because it's not functionalized. There's more silica there to interact with. Um, the other thing to point out here is that, you know, the, the loading range there is going to be really unique to whatever your, your compound is and your closest eluding impurity. So if you have really close eluding compounds, you're going to have to really work on the low end of that scale. Um, but if you have compounds that, you know, you have really good resolution around, then we can go ahead and maximize that loading and work towards the top end. Um, this is kind of a useful guide. It's also got optimal flow rates for the column sizes and then the approximate column volume. So you can kind of get an idea of uh, where col com compounds are coming out in regards to column volume there. And so the manual injection options, you have the lure port adapter. Uh, this is you know, easy for large amounts via syringe. Uh, the limitations of it are the, um, you get potential loss of sample if you're not flushing after injection, uh, just due to the uh, distance from the lower port to the uh, injection um, rotor. Uh, the other thing is you shouldn't exceed 50% of the loop size um, because of user variation and experience. So as you inject that in, you kind of create a laminar flow profile and you start to uh, inject, uh, as you're injecting, sample starts to come out the back end of the loop into the into the waste. So you don't want to exceed 50% of the loop size using the lower port adapter. And this is ultimately has inferior reproducibility and technique to your auto injection or auto sample samplers. Uh, another alternative is a lot of people like to use the blunt tip needle port. Um, and this is useful for method development on the analytical scale where sample loss needs to be mitigated. You'll so see this on a lot of analytical systems. Um, there's no need to flush the injection port because you're basically injecting right onto the, um, where the, the rotor valve and the seal uh, meet. The only limitations of this is this, the needle gauge size required um, isn't really optimal for prep, sale, prep scale injections because you're injecting larger volumes, so you're going to be uh, taking a longer time to load your sample. And once again, because of uh, user variation, it has inferior reproducibility uh, and technique to the auto injector, auto sampler module. The auto injector here is really neat feature. It allows multiple injections without having any user feedback or interaction. Uh, so you can do multiple runs sequentially. You're going to get improved peak shape and separation compared to your manual injections because it's a reproducible uh, injection procedure. Um, you can do injection volumes down to 10 microliters with the auto injector. And the only limitation is that you guys use one sample at a time. Um, so you can, um, and you only can do one, you can modify the injection volume after the fact, I guess. So, and then you need to wash the uh, auto injector probe um, 
following a uh, sequence on the system there so that it doesn't get uh, clogged up or precipitate out to clog it up. Now the auto sampler is really uh, builds upon this. Um, so you get the same, you can do multiple different samples with multiple injections uh, without any user interaction. Um, it allows you to change the injection volumes and, or different chromatographic methods. If you want to scout different methods, you can do that for the same sample. Um, you can uh, allow the system to stop after you do um, your first injection. Maybe you want to confirm that those are good, uh, those are the appropriate conditions, optimal conditions for your run before you continue. And it'll pause and wait for interaction. Otherwise, it's going to run through the queue um, uh, line by line until it's done without any interaction. And then it's got a completely automated wash process, so you don't have to worry about washing out the, the sampler probe. And then you get additional fraction collection capacity because of uh, um, additional two or four, depending on which auto sampler you have, uh, rack spaces. So here are some good habits, no matter what you're doing, auto sampler, auto injector, manual injection, um, sample prep um, choices to make to protect your prep column investment. Um, so first, generic column care. Read the instructions unique to your column. They should have a maximum pressure, uh, and you can set that in the Ac uh, AccuPrepR software unique to each column when you set up your columns. Uh, it should also tell you what allowable solvents you can use on it, pH limit, so if you're using modifier, uh, what pH range you can get into, and it should have storage conditions uh, located on it. When you're done using a column, it's very beneficial to wash out any buffers or modifiers you've used. Um, such as TFA, acetic acid, formic acid, and, and store in a strong uh, solvent or the strong solvent recommended in the storage conditions. And this prevents precipitation uh, and then breakdown of your bonded phase through hydrolysis of the, the functional, functional groups there. Um, so normally you're going to store this in a strong solvent. We don't want any bacteria or um, biologics uh, growing in the um, column if you have a high aqueous content. So normally you want to be at least 50% organic modifier um, to store it in or whatever is suggested by your column. So column issues that you can see in the chromatogram. Um, so when you start to see peak splitting, uh, a lot of times that's because you've started to uh, develop voids in your column or gaps. Um, and a lot of times this is caused from Kind of pressure pressure spikes a lot of times from DMSO. This is a DMSO is very viscous when it goes onto the column and creates kind of a pressure spike at the head of the column. Using guard columns helps minimize this kind of damage. Um, higher flow rates is something uh, if you're working at higher flow rates consistently on your columns outside of the range that's uh, specified, you can start to see voids develop um, in your column, and then. Uh, um, pH issues if you're using silica-based columns. Uh, if you go to uh, uh, pH larger than 7.5, you start to see some hydrolysis um, of the silica there. Um, and that's something that will help, that will develop voids and you'll see col poor column performance. Um, the other thing is uh, at low pH, silyl ethers hydrolysis, so being in the correct pH range for your col compounds. Um, and then loss of the bonded phase is going to cause peak splitting issues and poor uh, retention. Um, and it's good to wash the modifiers from our columns before storage overnight. So next question is how does sample dissolution solve and affect my chromatography? So I'm going to go to a flash example because we can actually visualize um, what's going on here. But this would be very similar for prep injection. So this is doing a liquid injection on a uh, flash column, and we've got the, the clear column body so we can actually see what's going on in the silica as we um, load the compound. And so on the left here is a picture of the column uh, with the compound. And as we inject it, as we've injected it, it's already running down the column. It's almost to the bottom of the column. It's not well resolved in that, um, with that solvent that we've chosen. On the right here, we've chosen a weak solvent. Dissolve it in, and we've probably and we've taken more solvent to dissolve it, but uh, and more solvent volume. But you can see once we've loaded it, we don't see any uh, elution down the the column front there. 
And so with the actual chromatography there, you can see the, the peak width of about, uh, let's say, five minutes there on the left versus uh, three minutes uh, on the right there. So you can see the band broadening just by loading in a strong solvent. And so we want to always try and dissolve it in the weak solvent uh, for uh, our sample loading. So considerations for your loading solvent, you would compromise between good dissolution while minimizing the effect on the integrity of your chromatography. And so um, if you're using a, a polar compound, a lot of times we use this, uh, use DMSO as a it's really good for dissolving things. And with polar compounds, we have to use DMSO a lot to help dissolve it and then load it on the, the column. So this is just an example where DMSO is used to load onto the column uh, at one, one milliliter injection of DMSO and in, in sample here. And we did the same in, uh, injection or same concentration, but 2.5 milliliters of it. And you start to see that we, we get, uh, you know, peak fronting, um, a peak two where we had resolution with one milliliter injection, but as we increase the the injection, we start to get uh, peak fronting and and, and force separation. So we've kind of um, maxed out how mo how much we can load onto the column with this method. Now, if we would have loaded this in a weaker solvent, maybe more of a weaker solvent, um, then we would we would uh, still have baseline resolution, and we wouldn't have um, encountered the poor separation conditions with the DMSO. So in this case, we dissolved that same concentration in 2.5 mils of water, and we're able to get baseline separation of the peaks here on the top. And so since we have baseline resolution to spare there, we can go ahead and increase the loading and load four, pump, four milliliters of water. So now we've loaded four times as much as we did in the DMSO sample. And um, increase our throughput that way. So keep in mind, this is obviously compounds that dissolve, um, we're able to dissolve in water and DMSO, but it illustrates the, the um, effect that we can have with that by trying to move to a weaker solvent. And one of the last things we're discussed today is uh, prep sample injection volume and loop size. Um, and so this is kind of an important consideration is how much sample can I load on there? Uh, and so based on some past literature, there's uh, kind of several different um, outcomes based on your injection technique. And so uh, one of the valve manufacturers suggests to fill the loop no more than halfway when doing your partial loop injection, which is essentially what you do on prep um, all the time because you don't want to lose any sample in order to maintain your precision and avoid sample loss. And the basis for this is that as we uh, load our sample, we basically get a laminar flow profile where um, the sample fluid has a parabolic velocity profile and the velocity at the center of the tube is about twice the average as at the wall of the tube. Um, well, the velocity at the wall of the tube is zero, sorry. And the average velocity is in between. So the exact effect on laminar flow profile is also dependent on the loop geometry and loading flow rate. So if you're running it, um, if you're injecting at slower um, rates, as with our injection auto injector, we don't see this laminar flow profile as it's not as significant. So essentially, there's three regions of injection variability, and uh, the partial filling region. And so this region uh, is volumetric precision is determined by the syringe. So basically, if I had a one mil syringe and I load uh, up to uh, 50 percent with a syringe, so I inject 500 microliters via syringe, I'm going to be within 1 percent of my uh, um, injection volume. It's limited by the syringe and the operator technique. Uh, the nonlinear uh, region would be the region probably from um, uh, 500 to 1 milliliter for that loop size. Uh, in this region, we start to see sample front, fluid front start to begin to dilute and then exit the sample loop after loading. And so obviously this is going to lead to sample loss and inferior performance, most importantly, sample loss for PEP HPLC. And then normally for analytical, if we want to uh, do an analytical injection, we want to say we want to inject 100 microliters, we're going to have a 100 microliter loop. We're going to inject three to five times that into the loop and overfill the loop. And that way we know that the loop is completely filled with sample. Um, and this gives us a 0.1% RSD. 
but you obviously have lost four times four times your sample uh, out the back end of the sample loop. So not this is not a, a feasible alternative for our prep scale separation. So another valve manufacturer suggests a loading technique to help eliminate this laminar flow profile and then increase your sample loop loading. And then it also prevents mixing uh, between the uh, sample fluid and your mobile phase. So if we were to put a small air bubble preceding the sample fluid uh, and basically separate the mobile phase from the, the sample plug, uh, it eliminates that laminar flow profile. And that laminar flow profile only occurs if mixing is allowed to occur in the loop. Uh, the authors noted that the precision and accuracy of partial loop loading are still functions of the operator in the syringe, though. So with the auto, auto injector and the reproducibility of the auto injector for your auto sampler, um, we can decrease the um, variation there. And this increases the range of linearity of the partial filling loop of the, the, the loop size. And this has been independently verified using uh, multiple manufacturers valves. So. How does this affect the, uh, our AccuPrep and the auto injector and, and uh, how we use PrEP HPLC though? So both manufacturers agree that the precision and accuracy of partial loop loading are functions of the operator and the syringe. So that's the, the biggest variable there and where we can see the biggest variability. The auto injector option offers an automated consistent method for injection. We have a controlled flow rate for loading from run to run and consistent valve switch timing. And this reproducibility, reproducibility helps to eliminate errors due to operator handling or variation. And the auto sampler takes it a step further as it also incorporates a series of steps that isolate the sample fluid plug with air pockets. So the auto sampler is actually able to go through a sequence where it draws up a small amount of air um, to separate that sample plug from the um, mobile phases we're injecting it. And then on the loop size, we talked about loop geometry being important. So in these smaller diameter, um, smaller diameter loops, like 100 microliter, one milliliter loops, it's a 1 16th tubing um, throughout. And so this is good for loading small volumes. Uh, smaller loop is great for the 4.6 millimeter column as you decrease your dwell volume. However, the larger, uh, um, you can't load above 50% of the loop size on this because we do see laminar, um, the laminar flow profile. We start to lose uh, linearity of our injection volume. Um, so this is uh, where you don't want to go above 50% um, of your loop size for these smaller diameter loops. For larger loops though, so traditionally you know, the systems are going to have five mil loops and larger and that's a one eighth out it transitions from a 1 16th to a 1 18th OD uh, tubing. That laminar flow profile changes on the transition from the tubing, and we see linearity throughout a lar longer range. So this increases our loading capacity. Uh, it also allows for dissolution uh, and increased volume of weaker solvent, so you can improve your chromatography that way. And sa since sample recovery is paramount in PrEP, uh, you can fill up to one milliliter less than the loop size for our AccuPrep system uh, with negligible sample loss. So if I were working on a five milliliter loop, I could load uh, four milliliters of sample up to four mils without any sample loss. Uh, if I have a 10 milliliter loop, I can work up to nine milliliters. If I have a 20 milliliter loop, I can work up to 19 milliliters of, of injection volume and see no sample loop loss out the back end. And this is part of the auto injector and, and uh, auto sampler um, is they help incorporate, or the auto sampler helps incorporate that air bubble to help prevent that laminar flow profile um, additionally. So if you're in manual injection, though, we don't suggest loading more than 50% of the loop size because of operation, operator variation. So in summary today, uh, we discussed different principles between PrEP HPLC separations. Uh, we highlighted some different approaches to method development and optimizations for resolution. We contrasted the benefits of different loading techniques. We showed the importance of choosing the best loading solvent and its effect on loading capacity and chromatographic integrity. And then we finally, we established some guidelines for sample loop loading and eliminating sample loss. So at this time, I would open it up to any questions that you guys may have regarding PrEP HPLC, 
separation, uh, maybe um, regarding any prep HPLC topics I didn't discuss here. There's a lot of different things we could discuss, but um, open it to your guys' questions. Uh, this is uh, Ron Lewis here. I want, on behalf of uh, Josh and uh, Teledyne ISCO, I'd like to thank everyone for their attendance today. I hope you found the uh, Josh's presentation to be uh, beneficial, helpful, insightful. Uh, we've got several questions here, uh, so that's uh, that's great. Uh, let me let me see if I can take a stab at answering these. Uh, the first one, it's a really good question. Uh, between TFA and formic acid, which one is preferred and why? That's a really good question. Uh, it's not a, I don't really have a good answer for that. Uh, that's, that's something that I don't think you'll find agreement on uh, between people. Uh, they're both TFA and formic acid are typically used uh, in reverse phase when there's a mass spec because it tends to um, increase ionization of your compounds. Now there are, um, and TFA is uh, primarily used, uh, or the generally used in the purification of uh, peptides. Uh, most peptide application notes that you see that will use TFA as a modifier. Not quite sure why, it's just been probably tradition more than anything else. There are arguments back and forth between formic acid and TFA uh, as far as a mass spec modifier. Some users will tell you that uh, they prefer formic acid because TFA tends to suppress ionization, and that seems to be true in some, in some types of samples. So, if you are using TFA with a mass spec and you're not getting good uh, response from your mass spec, you might switch and try formic acid uh, just to, to see if you are experiencing suppression. Uh, I know that there's, I've talked to customers uh, that have argued that TFA gives better performance and other customers will say it's uh, gives worse performance and hampers the uh, ionization process. So I think that um, that uh, it's just something that uh, you'll have to try, and it de really depends upon your type of compound which you're trying to purify. Uh, next question is: If higher pH modifiers has to be used of pH 7.4, is it really bad for the column? If yes, is the damage permanent? Really depends upon uh, your column. Uh, there are some columns that are manufactured specifically for operation at high pH. Therefore, they're uh, damaged. There, there's no damage uh, on those columns when operated at higher pHs. If you use more of a generic C18 compound, Yes, you can uh, start to dissolve your silica, break it down in the higher pHs, and that is permanent damage. Uh, it'll eventually cause voids in your in your columns and column bed collapse. As a general rule, you can uh, use it, um, but the main thing is don't store your column under either acid or basic conditions. Try to flush it with copious amounts of, of uh, water. Uh, there's been studies done that five to 10 column volumes of water followed by uh, switching back to a high percentage of uh, your organic phase, uh, typically methanol or acetonitrile for storage. Uh, as Josh mentioned, we definitely recommend storage above um, at least 50% uh, organic in water, but that's after a wash. And keep in mind, if you're dealing with 
compounds like formic and acid or ammonium formate as modifiers, uh, you should definitely use water to do the wash flush with prior to going to the uh, organic solvent because uh, they're much more soluble a lot of times in, in the aqueous phase. Uh, scout and focus column should be of same media and manufacturer or same media and different manufacturer can work. If you really need to use the same media and from the same manufacturer. Uh, the reason really is is because even though, uh, let's say for example, you're using C18, they are not different. C18 columns from different manufacturers will display different selectivity. Uh, you might be lucky enough and not have uh, not have um, compounds that are uh, susceptible to the uh, different bonding levels, and so you would get adequate so, adequate separation on both uh, phases. But uh, for matching for the gradient and switching from a focus to the the scouting run to the focus gradient on on the AccuPrep system, you definitely need to use columns from the same manufacturer in the same mobile phase or in the same stationary phase. Sorry. If a prep sample is filtered, then recovery will be left less. How to solve this uh, sample recovery issue? Um, don't think that I can really uh, agree with that statement. Uh, if you, unless you're filtering it through, it all depends on what you're filtering it through. Typically, uh, people use these uh, small micron uh, filters with a Teflon disc, which uh, has no absorbance of your of your sample. Uh, if you're filtering it through something that has a stationary phase bed, in, yes, you could get some uh, get some sample sticking. What you're really trying to filter out is any microparticles that could end up clogging your uh, column uh, and destroying your column over a long period of time. Uh, more about the comment, longer columns not necessarily better for larger molecules. Um, it, the mechanism that large molecules undergo with these Stationary when dealing with the stationary phase is a little bit different. Uh, if you have small molecules, uh, the the larger the column, the the more time it's going to spend and the, it's going to get down into the pores. Larger molecules tend to interact more with the uh, tops of the uh, C18 or C8 media. Uh, as as it stands up as a brush, it tends to not uh, get down into the pores and the voids in the columns as much just because of steric hindrance. And so therefore, you don't gain as much by adding length. Uh, you probably gain more by changing to shorter or longer column length to uh, to aid in the in the uh, equilibration or between between phases. And uh, let's see, I'm using a UV detector, it's the use of uh, formic acid and TFA recommended for separation, or is it used just for purposes of ionization? Uh, no, it's not used just for purposes of ionization. Uh, you'll notice that it, on compounds, a lot of compounds, it will decrease the uh, peak tailing and what it's really doing, it's uh, kind of buffering the stationary phase and eliminating some of the uh, secondary interactions that you that you see in reverse phase chromatography. <laughs>